Yeah, I've done it. That's on. Hi. Thank you. Uh, my name's Liz. I'm from London. I work for a company called Aqua Security. Uh, I don't really speak Japanese, but Yoroshiku Onegai Shimas. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, uh, we work on uh, helping enterprises secure their container deployments. And I've been working with containers for a few years now. And early on in that journey, I remember being quite confused about what exactly containers are. And then I saw a presentation by a gentleman called Julian Friedman from IBM, which really clarified for me what containers are. And this presentation is very much inspired by that. What we're going to do is we're going to write a container in a few lines of Go code. So containers aren't really a thing. They're made of some different features that are available in Linux. They're made from namespaces, from changing the root, and from control groups. So we're going to build a program that uses these three features to turn a process into a container. So, do I have any Go programmers in the room? Couple of hands, you are my peer reviewers. Hopefully for the rest of you, it will more or less make sense and, and be enough to illustrate what's going on. So, my Go program, if you were running a Docker, a Docker container, you'd type docker run, name of an image, and you might ask it to execute a command and some arbitrary parameters. For me, I'm gonna have go run main.go, I'm going to have a command run. I'm going to skip over the image name. And then I'm going to ask it to execute some arbitrary command and parameters. So I need a main function. And the first thing I'm going to do is look at the, oops, uh, the first argument. And if it's run, I am going to call a run function. Run. And if anything else gets passed in, I am going to panic and die, and bad things will happen. This is not production quality code, okay? <laughs> right, so my run function, uh, the first thing, let's get some space so we can move this up a bit. The first thing I'm going to do is just print out what I've been asked to do. So that is going to be passed in in arguments to and on, so a command and maybe some parameters. And then I want to actually execute this command. And I do that in Go by, first of all, I call this command function, which sets up a structure describing the command I want to run. And this takes the name of the command, and maybe there are some parameters. Oops. And I need to, I'm going to run. When, when I call the run function, that's when we're going to create a function. Underneath, inside that run function, it does something called clone, which creates a new Linux process. I also need to wire up std in, std out, std er, which is the equivalent of typing it, uh, yeah, dash it when you do docker run. So make it interactive and basically so that we can see what's going on. Stood in, stood out, and... Oh, I did that wrong. Stood out. Uh, I tried to get fancy using multiple cursors and it didn't work. Right. So at the moment, if I run this, go run main.go, I'm going to pass in that run command. And let's say I just ask it to echo hello rec 10. We get a line telling us what it's going to do. And then it does echoing hello rec 10. So we can just execute any command. Now let's start to think about containerizing that. And the first thing we're going to do is start giving it some namespaces. So a namespace restricts what a process can see. So it can only see a subset of what's actually happening on the host. 
And there are, depending on your kernel version, sort of half a dozen or more different namespace types. And we can, when we create the function, we can say, please create this with a new namespace or more than one namespace. So the first namespace I'm going to ask for, so uh, we, we were at the point where we were just creating our um, namespace for the host name called Unix Time Sharing System. So this time I'm going to, rather than running echo, I'm going to run a shell. It's hard to tell, but I'm inside my shell that's running inside what's going to become my container. If I type host name at the moment, it's inherited it from the host machine. I can change the host name inside the what's becoming a container, but if I go to the host machine, oops, it hasn't affected that. So I've been able to change it on the container without affecting the host. That's what a namespace does. It isolates something so that the host and the, con the container's view is separate from the host's view. So, as I mentioned, it's hard to tell that I'm in a container, and I would like to have my bash prompt uh, show that maybe I want to set my host name and have it show a different host name. So, you might think I could do something like um, set host name. I mean, this is a thing, set host name. And I could set it to con container, but if I call that here, I, it won't get executed until after my command is finished. And if I call it before I execute that run command, I haven't actually created a new namespace. The, the new namespace actually only gets created inside this run function. So I'm going to do a little trick here. We're going to do this twice. So the first time, we're not going to set the host name, we're going to run Instead of running the command itself, we're going to run this program again. And we can do that by going to slash proc self exe. I have to do a little bit of um, kind of go sort of syntax here to get the, um, we're going to, instead of passing run this second time around, we are going to pass um, child as the command name. So in run, we're going to create the namespace, call this function again, but instead of run, we're going to go with child. We're going to call child function, which is going to be like this. And this is the one that's going to execute our actual command we're trying to run. We don't need to create the namespace but we can set the host name before we do it because we should be inside our new namespace. So let's give that a while. And you can see from the bash prompt, that's worked. We've been able to set the host name. We see this um, print line happening twice because we're calling two functions. So now I'd like to do the same namespacing for processes. Because at the moment, if I do PS to get a list of processes, I can see everything that's running on the host. So, you might think, I can just pass in another one of these flags, clone new process ID. And we'll log out the process ID that we get. Uh, let's get process ID. We'll do that in both run and in child. exit and run again and you can see immediately we got process ID number one and that's because we've got a new namespace that's allocating new process IDs but if I do PS we still see all of the processes and the reason for that is that slash prop directory again inside slash prop oops we can see information about all the currently running processes. And this is where PS is getting its information from. So I need a different version of slash proc inside my container so that it can have just the subset of processes 
in my process ID namespace. And to do that, I'm going to need slash to be something different, so that slash prop can be something different. And we're going to use cheroot to do this. So this is changing root, where we're going to point root in the container to be some subdirectory somewhere on the host's file system. Now, I happen to have, conveniently, uh, a, an Ubuntu file system sitting here. And I've got a file in here labeling it as root full container. So, I am going to, where do I do it? I do it here. We will cheroot to that subdirectory which happens to have everything you would need to run an Ubuntu Linux. I'm also going to explicitly change directory to root because weirdly that cheroot call leaves you in some unspecified directory. Okay, so now I can see that in my root directory I am now pointing at this root for container. So now my container can't see everything on the host file system. It can only see this subset of the file system that we've cherooted to. And that's basically what's happening with a container image. You unpack the file system from a container image and cheroot the container into it. So this is like having an Ubuntu container image. So now if I run PS, anybody think this is going to work? Not quite. We just have one more thing to do. Oops. Sorry. Um, we need to uh, mount proc, proc, proc. Board of proc now. There we go. And I'm going to tidy this up at the end as well. Unmount. Oops. So this is really telling the container to use that slash proc directory to, um, or it's telling the kernel to use it as a pseudo file system with all that kind of process information in it. Okay, so now, fingers crossed, we get PS seeing just the processes inside the container. That's pretty good, right? Those processes still exist from the host perspective and they've actually got a high number from the host perspective. But the container can only see these processes in its own namespace. Okay. You can probably imagine how, oops, too far, how we could do a similar thing for other namespaces to do things like isolate the container's networking or uh, set up user IDs that work specifically for that container. I'll leave that as an exercise for your imagination. We will go on and talk a little bit about control groups. So if namespaces restrict what the process can see, control groups restrict the resources that the process is allowed to use. So you can specify how much memory or how much CPU, or what I'm gonna do is how many processes are allowed to run inside this control group. And they're set up in a slightly different way basically by writing information into files. In the interests of time, I have a function that I've written earlier. I'm going to copy that in here. And before I forget, I'm going to make sure I call it. Okay, so what this does is it goes to where the C group files exist in the system. It's going to we're looking at the process IDs control group. Uh, I'm creating one called Liz. I am saying here, I write into a file to say the maximum number of processes I want running in this control group is going to be 20. And then finally, I take the current process ID and I write it into the set of processes that are in this control group. So I'm adding the currently running process into that control group that can only run up to 20 processes. So, 
if I do this, nothing at this point is visibly different, but it allows me to do something kind of risky. What I'm about to do is set off a fork bomb. This is not something you should do on any of your production systems. So, fork bomb. I'm going to define a bash function called colon. And in that function, I'm going to call colon. And I'm going to pipe the results into colon, which I'm going to run in the background. So that is just going to keep spawning more and more and more processes that will keep trying to run this function that will keep spawning more and more and more processes ad infinitum. And then I just need to invoke that. If you run this on a host, it will probably eat up all the resources and you know, drag that machine to its knees. Okay, so it pretty quickly is unable to find the resources to run any more processes. But the good news is, if I've done it correctly, if we look at all the processes from the host perspective, we should see here are, I haven't quite got enough room here, have I? Let's see if I can make this bigger. Oops. There will never be more than 20 processes here. This, if we weren't inside a control group, if we didn't have the limitations of a control group, this would be in the thousands. So we've used control groups to effectively limit the number of processes that we can run inside our container. So in less than 70 lines of code, we've built a little container that has some isolation from namespace point of view that can only see the processes inside that container. And we've seen how to limit the resources that it can use. We've also seen how to use Chiroot to point to what we can consider to be the container image. So hopefully that gives you some impression that a container is really just a Linux process. It has a restricted view of the world. It may have restrictions on how many resources it can use, but it's really just a process. If you want to see the code, that's the GitHub repo where it, it, with that code and maybe a little bit more. There's also a link to a longer version of this presentation that maybe goes into a little bit more detail. And I will be over there to take questions very shortly. So with that, thank you very much. <laughs>